Tonight, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for everything you do for us. Thank you for being good to us and providing for us and making sure that we have what we need. And we're thankful, Father, for the opportunities that came our way today to, uh, to express compassion, uh, to extend grace and mercy to others, uh, to shine your light and to be the salt of the earth. We pray, Father, that we made the most of the opportunities, uh, that with the blessings and the things that you have given us, that we have used them to your glory and your honor. Uh, and helped uh, someone else that we came across, whether it was a brother or sister or family member, a church family member, even a complete stranger, that we, we, made, we did something and made a small impact in your name. We're thankful for this time that's been set aside in the middle of the week to gather together to study a portion of your word, uh, to just encourage one another uh, by being here, and we're thankful for that. For every family that is here today, uh, here tonight, we pray uh, that we will be blessed by being here and for every family unable to be with us we pray that you will bless them help them to have a good week and we pray father uh, that we will uh, that we will always be mindful of the things you do for us it's in jesus name we pray amen all right so we've been in the book of exodus for a little while now so what we're going to do today and this will cover us for the next class meetings as well i'm going to do a couple of things we're gonna, not going to hit a pause but we need to get some surrounding information with things. So we're going to talk about Pharaoh, and we're going to talk about the plagues, and then when we get back from the Christmas break, we'll talk about Pharaoh's heart in this uh, apparent paradox of God hardening Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh hardened himself, uh, and how that can square, and, and kind of what that would mean for us. So I wanted uh, tonight just to kind of give some background information as we've covered the first couple of chapters of the book of Exodus like I said, just give a pause, some of the things, some history, uh, some things around uh, Pharaoh himself, some things around the plagues, uh, the ten plagues, and kind of what that means. So I, this is the best picture I could come up with, and it's a terrible picture, uh, but I at least wanted to give you an idea of how uh, extensive the Egyptian empire probably was. So you barely see it, uh, but you've got all this outline in the dark green, but really if you wanted to go all the way up to what we know of today is Libya, all the way down here, you come over into this peninsula, Israel, other places, that would be the extent of the Egyptian empire at the time of Moses, the time of the Exodus. So it, it's a very extensive empire. Uh, if you remember your history or if you follow history, you usually have the upper kingdom, you've got the lower kingdom. Pharaoh is in charge of all of it, uh, all the pharaohs, actually. They, they just succeeded one another. Uh, history can fill in the blanks as far as names are concerned. We've already mentioned this prior, that the book of Exodus doesn't really concern itself with Pharaoh. We don't know his name. We don't know how old he is. The only thing we know is that he, uh, does, he, he comes to power and he doesn't know Joseph. So Joseph's influence, uh, Joseph's legacy, Joseph's name... None of that is there to protect Israel anymore. Uh, and of course, Israel at the time is, is just, a, uh, they're enslaved, they're a workforce uh, in that. So who was Pharaoh? You know, we're not necessarily concerned with a name as much as Pharaoh is a title. Uh, that's what's used predominantly within Scripture. Uh, so Pharaoh was considered to be a representative of the Egyptian chief god uh, or the idol. Whoever the chief god was, most of the time... Most pharaohs just accepted Ra. If you've ever heard of Ra, the Egyptian god Ra, uh, then that's what they represented. That's who they were. They were representative of that god. If a pharaoh wanted to change it and said, well, this idol is going to be our chief god, well, then that's what they did. But for the most part, it was, um, it was, it was Ra, and we'll talk a little bit more about him uh, in a few minutes. But he served as a representative uh, of, of the god, uh, of the gods in the pantheon of the Egyptian idols. Uh, he also, while on earth, he was considered to be a mediator between the gods and the people. He's considered to be the in-between. So whatever the will of the gods was, uh, whatever they wanted him to do, um, is what he did. And he mediated. He was in-between. Uh, there is not, it's not a coincidence that the scripture, when it's being written in the Old and New Testament, mediator should be a, a, a word we're very familiar with. Uh, that should be something that we know of. When, when Moses goes up to receive the Ten Commandments, he goes by himself. He serves as a mediator between Yahweh and the people. Pharaoh did the same thing. So Israel, just from a history point of view, is almost structured like the pagan nations behind uh, that surround her. 
Uh, Israel has a mediator. Egypt has a mediator. Uh, Assyria, uh, a couple of other places that we're familiar with, with that. After death, to begin with, it was thought that Pharaoh after death would die, and then he would become divine. As Egyptian history goes along, as Egyptian power spreads, uh, it is believed that Pharaoh becomes divine prior to death. So the moment a Pharaoh took office or assumed the throne, he is a divine individual. He, is, uh, he becomes a god. So if he has children, specifically a son, what do you think the son is called? Son of God. You've got something in that regard. So you see this divinity. If you follow even New Testament, you look at uh, the Caesars. The Caesars end up being believed that they are divine. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is a God. Uh, he is a representative. So Caesar, Rome, structures herself after the way that Egypt does. Uh, so you have all these mediators. Uh, and, and after death, you've got uh, divinity. So you've got a very very powerful individual who is seen in a lot of ways. He's considered, every Pharaoh was considered to be all-knowing and to be all-powerful. There wasn't anything that Pharaoh could not do. Uh, have any of you ever watched, it was several, several years ago, any of you ever watched the uh, cartoon uh, Prince of Egypt? Anybody ever seen that before? It's actually a pretty good representative, representation, the Pharaoh and that, which is considered to be Ramesses. There are several times throughout that cartoon, if you haven't watched it, it's pretty good. So yes, I'm giving you permission. You can go home and watch something like that. Uh, that he will, he will declare numerous times that he is powerful by my command, by my voice, by my word. Uh, he will you'll have phrases like that. That's because Pharaoh, all he has to do is speak and it happens. Right? Caesar takes the same thing. Christ comes onto the scene, he just but speaks. Remember the centurion? You don't have to come and do anything. All you got to do is just say the word and it happens. That's not unique. That's not unique. That claim is not unique. The reality is unique because Pharaoh couldn't really just speak and things happen. Claim that. But he was believed to be all-powerful. He's believed to be all-knowing. One of the things that Pharaoh was in control of uh, more than anything was nature and fertility. Not fertility in the sense of human beings, but the ground is able to produce its crop. The Nile is able to be what it is because of Pharaoh. And he's able to control nature. Uh, so science has revealed, you know, I'm sure you probably know this, that the Nile floods at certain times of the year. But science has revealed kind of why that is. But before, that was, hey, Pharaoh's the one that makes this happen. Pharaoh's the one that's got this power. And then it's not just Pharaoh, but then the God of the Nile or the God of whatever it is that he represents. Because he has this power, Pharaoh is responsible for Egypt's economic well-being and spiritual well-being. What does God do in the totality of the ten plagues? What does God do? He attacks right at the core of Pharaoh's claims. He hits him where Pharaoh is going to truly be tested and shown to be a fraud, that he cannot do anything. At, one, at some point, one of the reasons why Pharaoh most likely changes his mind with the tenth plague, separate and apart from a personal reason, is because his economy is crippled. Yeah, his approval rating, right? It, it, was, going, it was less than 30%, right? I mean, you're looking at that. I mean, it, it is his approval. And people then... They would forcibly remove you, even a pharaoh. They, they were not going to take prisoners. But he's responsible for her economic well-being and spiritual well-being. And he's responsible not for her spiritual well-being in the sense like our elders are for us and we're reading the word. It is his main job is to promote Egyptian idolatry. This God can do this. This God can do this. This God can do this, etc., etc. So the spiritual well-being is... Ra, the God of the sun, will take care of us. Well, guess what God does for three days? Yahweh. He blots out the sun for three days. He's crippling. He's crippling Egypt's well-being, spiritual well-being, and economic well-being. Uh, Pharaoh was believed to have, he, he needed to rule with something that was called ma'at. And that is a combination of four things. Harmony, balance, peace, and order. 
How many of those things survived the ten plagues? So if, if you get to the end of the ten plagues, you get to the end of just even the first one. And let's say he's not as stubborn as he's supposed to be. Let's say God finally, his will is finally broken. How much harmony exists after water's been turned into blood? How much peace exists after water turns into blood? How much uh, balance exists if your water source is blood? All of these things. God is turning Pharaoh upside down. And he's exposing him for what he really is. Nothing. And that's really in general. That's any world leader at any world time. What are they? On one hand, they are powerful. And then on one hand, they are nothing. Right? This is, this is why, as a side note, this is why politics are something we are engaged in. But it is not the end all be all. Because it's everything. And it's nothing. Pharaoh. It's just a footnote within the story uh, of that. So plagues, when the plagues come, knowing all of these things about Pharaoh, when the plagues come, you'll notice that they are in groups of three. And they all have a specific theme. So they're not in order, but if you were to pick them and put them into groups, there are three groups. So if you took plague one, number seven, and number nine, they all impact nature. Water turning to blood, hail, and darkness. They all impact nature. That's their impact. God is going directly to Pharaoh's control over nature. Pharaoh's representation of control over nature. If you look at plagues 2 through 5, and then also plague 8, which is frogs, lice from the dust, the flies, the swarm of flies, livestock dying, locusts coming and doing everything and that, it's an impact on animal life. It's an impact on animal life. It's, that's the direct impact. Humanity, Egyptians are indirectly impacted, but God impacts animal life. And then, if you look at plague 6 and plague 10, which is the boils and then the death of the firstborn, it's an impact on human life and animal life. And it is only until human life is truly impacted that Pharaoh is finally broken. And it's not anything in terms of breaking a human being literally. God breaks this hardened heart, he breaks it. This will, he breaks it. He finally breaks it. Uh, I mentioned this last week, out of each plague, after each plague, what does God send Moses to say to Pharaoh? Okay, it's almost as if God is saying, I don't want to do this, but you're going to continue to go down this path, you're not going to change so I'm going to do this. But I want you to know, you can let my people go at any moment. When you spiritualize that, and you get in over to Romans, where Paul makes this argument in chapter 9 and 10, that groundwork of chapters 9 and 10 in the book of Romans is laid out in chapter 1, where God gives a person who is so stubborn that they're going to live in such a way that no matter what God does in His intervention, he is finally left to no other recourse but to give them over, to give them up. And this is, and I've mentioned this, but this is where I got it from, from my, uh, my Old Testament professor. Humility is breaking a human being. That's what humility is. When we humble ourselves before God, we are breaking our will. That's what we're doing. We're, we're humbling ourselves. We're breaking our pride. So that we can be submissive. But humility comes in one of two ways. We either do it voluntarily. Or God does it to us. But there's really no other way. And Pharaoh serves as a prime example for all of us. That God will allow us to make our decisions. But humility is going to happen. Which way do I want it to happen? Do I want it to happen voluntarily? With submission and faith and obedience. Do I want it to happen the hard way? And when you look at Philippians chapter 2. You know how we talk about Christ. You know humbled himself through that whole thing. You know how the whole passage ends. Kind of stop around verse 8 and 9. But it goes on to actually verse 10 and 11. You know what that says? Therefore God has exalted him. And has given him a name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Right? That's what it says. You know what that is? He's humbling the world. 
He is going to humble humanity. God will humble humanity. What He wants of us, if we're willing to do it, is to voluntarily humble ourselves now. Because it's better to be humble now than it is to be humbled later. It is better for, for Pharaoh to be humbled after plague one than it is to, to, to be humbled after plague ten. And that's something that we got to, it's a daily battle, but we need to choose humility. Uh, and this is what God does through all of this. So, you've probably seen, I don't know if you've ever been to an exhibit, you've probably seen kind of this headgear that a pharaoh would wear. Uh, this kind of an artist rendition. Uh, right up here, uh, they don't did, didn't do a very good job, but a pharaoh would have two snakes, big venomous snakes. This one probably... A little bit better. Can you kind of see the outline right there? Maybe people up front can see it a little bit better. But just envision that Pharaoh with his headdress and everything like this, just like it is, right here he would have two snakes. Any ideas of why? Why would he have two snakes? I mean, no wrong answers, just, just asking for a guess. Okay if, one, okay, if one doesn't get you, the other one will. Okay, what else? Just, I mean, I'm just looking for a guess. No wrong answers. I mean, it's just, I'm going somewhere with this. But just any ideas, just off the top of your head, if you had to guess. What, well, actually both, yeah, I thought the same thing, but actually both of them are venomous. And what the snake represented, because you kind of see it, again, this one's, uh, this one's better at it. They're kind of, you know, you kind of see it, they look like they're ready to attack. What they would do is it represents that the venom is coming from the snake and it's going towards the enemy. Okay, that the, the, the snake is going to strike. And of course, it being venomous, you're not going to last. You, you can't withstand. The idea is two things. It's a twofold thing. One, Pharaoh's powerful. He's just powerful. And when he's powerful and when he strikes, you don't survive. What is the very first thing when Moses says... You know what? I can't walk in there empty-handed. What am I supposed to do? What does God tell him to do with the staff? Throw it down and it turns into a snake. So Moses does that, right? And what do, what do Pharaoh's magicians do? Okay, they do the same thing. So you would think as you're reading this narrative, as you're reading this epic, oh, we're about to have the showdown. Pharaoh's snakes are going to prevail. What actually happened? Moses' staff, the one that turned to a snake, ate him. The idea, the idea, it swallowed him whole, and then you can just imagine Moses just picks it right back up and it turns right into a staff. What do you think God is trying to tell Pharaoh? Before we go down this road, what do you think he's trying to tell Pharaoh? The idea of God, it's, it's Yahweh versus Pharaoh. Set yourself up against me. I, you, you believe that you are powerful. I'm going to show you power. Here's the other thing. What is the snake most famous for within the scripture? Genesis 3. And of course you got lies. So you got all that it represents with deception, with lies. But you've got Satan. You've got the evil one. Well, finally, when you get into the New Testament, what does the evil one do per Genesis 3.15? He strikes or he bruises the, the heel. But what will the seed of the woman do? Crush his head. This sets up what, what academic will call typology. Moses is doing all of these things. God is going through all of this and laying these breadcrumbs. Pharaoh, you, you have all of this power. You can do all of these things, and everybody knows that when you strike, no one stands. I'm about to show you what really happens, but before I do that, let my people go. Let my people go. So, I wanted to give you just the idea of the gods here and the ten plagues. I don't know how much you know about numbers or if you even bother to look at stuff like that within the Scripture, but the number ten in the Scripture represented a fullness or completeness. Where, is, where else do you see the number 10? 10? 10 commandments. 10 commandments. 10 words is what they would literally be. The idea is that the whole law 
God really didn't need to be expounded on. You have ten. You've got the complete. You go, if you follow these ten, we don't need what inevitably becomes 613. You just need ten. It's complete. It's full. Well, the idea of ten plagues, Egypt is going to be completely plagued. Completely plagued. This isn't going to be a partial. This isn't going to be 75%. This isn't going to be 90%. This is going to be 100% a plague that reaches down into the very roots of the empire, starting with Pharaoh himself. So the very first one, in terms of a representation, and I'll show you a picture when we get through with this, the very first plague is water to blood, right? The Egyptian god of the Nile was Hapi. And it turned water in... It, it's the god of water. It's the god of the Nile. You know, this, this, you know, the Nile ebbs and flows. That's because this god is doing all of these things. He's in control of this. What's interesting is, is that's the very first one. What are Pharaoh's magicians able to do? Do you remember? Okay, yeah, they duplicated. They were able to do whatever it was. Uh, I, you know, they were able to turn it into, into blood. Uh, it, and every commentator says that that's what it was, that it wasn't just some food coloring or anything like that, that it turned into that. So that tells you that behind these idols, this is what Paul tries to communicate, an idol in of itself is nothing. It's just dead like this. But what's behind it is alive. It's a darkness. It's a, it's a, a demon. It's something that's there. That idol is lifeless. It is not breathing. It does not blink. It does not eat. It does not grow tired. Any of that. But what's behind it, that's real. And that's what Paul tries to communicate in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9 when he tells the Corinthians, you go to that temple, you go and worship. If you go and are part of something that is pagan, it's not the idol that you're worshiping. It's not the idol that you're participating in. You're doing something even darker. So when we get to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians 11, the end of chapter 10 and 11, what does darkness have to do with light? How can we eat at the table of demons and eat at the table of Christ? There's something there, something dark, something sinister. So these magicians, they are not illusionists. They're doing something by some sort of dark power that is there. Whatever it is, they're tapping into something. How dark of an individual do you have to be to be able to tap into that? The closest one we have is King Saul. When he taps into the witch of Endor, who raises the soul of Samuel, the spirit of Samuel. The next, the next one, uh, with the frogs, the Egyptian god Heket. It's the goddess of fertility and water and renewal. That's what she represented. So when the frogs come out, they reproduce quickly. And it's just, they overtake everything. But they also ruin things. You go on, uh, the god of the dust, where lice comes from, is the god Geb. Then you've got the Egyptian god Kefri, which is the god of creation, the movement of the sun, and rebirth. And that's where the flies come in. Uh, you got the lice in the other one. Uh, then the Egyptian goddess Hathor. It's the goddess of love and protection. That's the death of the livestock. She can't really protect anything if the cattle are just dropping literally like flies. Then you've got the Egyptian goddess Isis. Many of us will probably be familiar with her. She's the goddess of medicine and peace. You know what God does? He strikes them with boils and sores. And nothing can heal them. What is this God? He's rendering them all powerless. He's showing them all powerless. And what they can do. Egyptian goddess Nut, not Nut, but Nut, goddess of the sky. She controls the weather. This is what she does. Well, guess what God does? That's what Yahweh does. He makes it hail. I wonder how many times some sort of prayer or something was, was directed towards the goddess Nut. And the hail doesn't stop. The flies don't stop. The frogs don't stop. Uh, you've got the Egyptian god Seth, who's the god of storms and disasters. Well, you've got locusts. They come and finish off whatever's there. Then you've got the Egyptian god Ra, which is the god of the sun. And that's when you have the darkness. Which, as a side note, what was the only part 
of Egypt that was not in the dark. Do you remember? Where Israel was in the land of Goshen. It's where Israel was. Everything else is perpetual darkness. But Israel is in perpetual light. Well, we read this a couple of weeks ago on Sunday night. Paul will tell us in 1 Thessalonians, you are not children of the darkness. You are not children of perpetual darkness. If you are in Christ, you are children of light. Uh, so here's what the gods look like. Here's what the gods look like. So this is the first one, water to blood. Uh, this, is, this is the Egyptian god. I want to make sure I say it right since I don't have my notes up there. I got them written down. Uh, this is the Egyptian god, Hopi. You can see the color. She's aqua. I mean, he is aqua. So he controls the water. You'll recognize this one. It literally had a frog head. You think all of these things are coincidence in what God is doing? When he sends the plague, he is communicating to everyone. This is what you think about this. Here's what I think. I will take what you worship and plague you with it. I will take what you believe in and what you trust in and actually turn it and show you that it's not good. And then you have this one. You, so you have Hopi, you have Heket, uh, which was again with the frogs, and you've got Geb. This is the god Geb. It's where the lice, the god of the earth, god of the dust, this is where the lice comes from. This one was unique. I don't know how well you can see it, uh, but this is Kefi. This is with the flies. What's interesting is that anybody, can you kind of make out what this is? Yeah, it's a scarab or a scout or a beetle. Let's just call it a beetle, right? What's interesting is that when it said flies, it was most likely this as opposed to what we think is a common fruit fly. So you just imagine swarms of beetles. But God is taking these representations that humanity's created and has turned into objects of worship. And he has turned it on all them. And remember that Pharaoh is a representation of all of this. He's a representation. The gods are summed up in him. He is the representation of the gods. He has this power. Uh, you have uh, the god Hathor, the goddess of love and protection. Uh, this is the death of livestock. So you see kind of where her power would be. Uh, you, some of us may have seen this symbol before. Uh, so you should recognize that. Uh, this is the goddess Isis. Goddess of peace, medicine. This is the one where you kind of see they have some of the same headdress. She's spreading her wings. This is the goddess Newt. You can kind of see how everybody is living their life under the sky. You see kind of the stars. And then guess what they're doing? They'd be worshiping. Goddess of the sky. And then you've got the god Seth. Uh, who has, again, we talked about that, the power of everything, and then you have Ra. Anybody seen this similar headdress before? Who wears something similar to that? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Why? Because I am the chief of them all. I am divine. This is who I am. Uh, so that is, in a nutshell, that is kind of a background on Pharaoh and the plague. So before we look at some New Testament things, what God does and some types, any, any questions, comments? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm only confined it to just those ten, but yes, they were like the Greeks and the Romans just had a pantheon, just had plethora of gods. Anything else? Any other questions? We'll get into the plagues themselves specifically, but let's look at a couple of New Testament scriptures that kind of highlight what Jesus does uh, in this. So let's turn first uh, to Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6. Passage we know of very well. We'll look at verse 10. And we'll read.
read down to verse 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. How much flesh and blood did Moses and Aaron really wrestle with in the Exodus account? Maybe one, Pharaoh himself. And yet the ten plagues are the wrestling match. I always, I have in just about every Bible that I've got, the Exodus account next to this. These things that we just went through, I know we kind of look at the drawings and things like that and what they would represent, but these things are powerful. These cosmic powers. It's not that Ra is real, because he is not. But it's what stands behind it. A cosmic power. A force of evil. Whatever it is. And the thing about it that I think of a lot is that nothing has changed. They just look different. But who here today didn't wrestle with something dark? Who didn't fight against something that seems like, has it seemed like life's working against you lately? We say that kind of, I just think, every, I think this, the whole world is against me. There's a little bit of truth to that. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against these rulers, these authorities, these cosmic powers. Again, it's not that the God is, that these idols are real. But there are things that are out there that Moses... Aaron and others had to contend with, and we do as well. We contend with these things. We contend with idolatry. We contend with false gods every day. We contend with Satan himself as a roaring lion. We contend with temptation. We contend with all of these things each and every day. There's not going to be a day under the earth that we don't fight against this and wrestle against it. How can we enter those moments Inequipped and ill prepared. Let's look at the book of Colossians. Something else that Paul will say here and what Jesus did when it came uh, to the gospel. So we're going to look at two passages from here and then we'll close, we'll close for tonight. So let's start in chapter one and begin with verse nine. So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us. From the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. How has he done that? How has God done that? He has done that with the redemption and the forgiveness of sin. But he didn't do it with a staff that turned into snake. He didn't do it with a hand that turned into leprosy. How did God do that? He did it with his blood. That's why the next passage lifts up Jesus in the way that it does. Uh, and if you read, starting verse 19, that in Christ all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And who was the character we just saw in the Old Testament that had the representation of the Egyptian gods in him? Pharaoh. Who is the man of the New Testament that has the full Godhead that dwells within him? Jesus. In him is the fullness of God pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And then one more later on uh, in chapter 2. We're going to begin with verse 11. In Christ also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through the working. Uh, through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, 
having forgiven all of our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And then notice the language of verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Which rulers did he disarm in the book of Exodus? We just saw ten of them. Which ones did he put into open shame? We just saw that. And then you get into the New Testament. Who do you think these rulers and these powers are? Satan? Guilt? Shame? Condemnation? Eternal damnation? The list goes on and on. Things that sin has done to us. And what has God done through Christ for us? He has disarmed them. He has put them to open shame. And He has made us victorious in Him. And how did He do it? By faith, baptism, and blood. It's the same thing. It's the whole book of Exodus condensed into about four or five verses. This is an ama- this, the, what we're studying. I'm going to leave you with this. We'll pick back up in a couple of weeks when I get back into town. We'll leave you with this. What we're studying in the book of Exodus is our story too. When you went into the water, you had your own Exodus. When I went into the water, I had my own Exodus. And in Christ, no ruler and no no cosmic power and no evil force can overwhelm us because he has disarmed us. If shame has power in my life, it's because I give it power. If guilt has power in my life, it's because I give it power. If sin and temptation have power in my life, it's because I'm the one that's giving it. He's already disarmed it. He's already put it to open shame. What I need to do is to put my faith not in myself or in those things, but in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So I hope that this will be something that you'll, you'll continue on with us as we go uh, into the rest of the book of Exodus. But maybe this gives you a little bit of background. Thank you for being here. The class is yours.